Hello everyone, how are you doing today? It's Makeda Valera, also known as the Renaissance Amazon and the Body Scientist. Right now I am live on my IG page. I have several. Um, I'm on my IG page, Copper Showgirl. I will save this and repost it to my YouTube page, the Renaissance Amazon. I know I have all these names. Um, I'll put them below. Um, in case you're unfamiliar with me, I am an exercise physiologist, sports nutritionist, just completed a master's degree in medical cannabis science. So I have committed my life to studying all the ways we could take our body to its highest level. And I'm very anti-pharmaceutical, okay? And so, then make sure you follow my page, The Body Scientist, as well. I get more into health stuff on that page, okay? Usually I don't post health conversations on this page, but I just wanted to do a quick talk because um, you guys know I'm also a dancer. I'm a hip-hop lover, okay? And if you don't know Rich Homie Kwan, he's a rapper. He passed away. They say it's from a drug overdose, but it hasn't been confirmed. Um, but it's brought up a lot of things in my mind because, you know, music can hold a special places in our heart. And, you know, I, when I think of Rich Homie Kwan, I think of the song Lifestyle that came out, I think, 10 years ago. Um, and... During that time, I, that was like a traumatic time for me, actually. I was like going through a really traumatic breakup. They had my mind all like, what the hell? And I was diving deep into my pole dancing. Pole dancing helped me to like get my mind off of whatever. And that song was bumping at that time. And so I just remember being sad and trying to lift myself up out of the sadness and being on the pole. And that song was popular at the time. At the time. So it always takes me back to that time. And when I told one of my friends what happened, you know, when he found out that he died from a drug overdose, some of my friends instantly just started calling him, you know, stupid or saying it was dumb. And I said, you know, it hasn't been confirmed what happened, but it could very well have been an opioid overdose, okay? Um, there's this female rapper who was with Gucci Man. I didn't know who she was, so she passed away. Um, this young girl who, she passed away I think a couple of months ago, also from an opioid overdose, okay? Um, Gangsta Boo passed away from an opioid overdose. Now, again, they didn't confirm that. I'm just assuming that. And if it's not an opioid overdose, I'm going to talk about it anyway. Oh, Enchanting was her name, yes. And uh, somebody asked me, when's my next dance video? If you want to see more dance videos and you want to ask me about that, then join my loyal fans page. I post dance videos there all the time. Otherwise, don't ask me on social media when I post another dance video, when I feel like it. I post dance videos on a regular basis on my Loyal Fans page. So if you want to see more of my dance videos where I post several of them a week, go there. Okay? Yeah, so her name was Enchanting. I didn't know who she was until she passed away. But the thing about it is, you know, before I understood, I mean, addiction is a real thing. We all hear that. But I understand it on a scientific level. Okay, and then in my training, completing my uh, master's degree in medical cannabis science, um, we learned a lot about how the opioid receptors cross talk with the cannabinoid receptors. And I'm gonna do a more in-depth scientific conversation about this, about opioids and cannabis, um, on my page, The Body Scientist. So be sure to follow me on Instagram at The Body Scientist, the underscore body underscore scientist. And um, also, um, hold on a second. Also, follow me on YouTube, The Body Scientist 81, okay? Because I'm going to be doing a more in-depth talk about it. Um, somebody said these drugs are not the same how they used to be. Well, opioids was never meant to be a recreational drug, okay? They were, they, they, the pharmaceutical industry caused this problem. People get addicted to it because the doctors prescribe it, and then they start looking for it on the street and taking Xanax and, you know, all these different pills. It's highly addictive. An addiction is a chemical thing. Like, I'm addicted to caffeine, okay? <laughs> I don't drink coffee um, because I feel like coffee is too addictive. So I used to drink coffee and I don't drink coffee. That's the one thing that's hard about traveling out of America is that a lot of people don't have tea options like the U.S. does because I drink um, matcha and yerba mate. Yerba mate is a caffeinated tea from South America. But I cannot do coffee. But when I used to drink coffee... It's highly addictive. Like, if I didn't drink it when I first woke up in the morning, I would have a banging headache. 
You know, Advil is very addictive. I don't take Advil for headaches. I do not take Advil for pain or headaches. I have not since I was in the seventh grade. I talk about this in a lot of my videos on my page, The Body Scientist. Like, I was addicted to Advil in the seventh grade. So when I learned then about that, I didn't know I was addicted to Advil, right? And when I learned that, oh, because I was getting headaches all the time, like, oh, if you take Advil for headaches a couple of times, then what happens is if you don't take the Advil, you'll get headaches, okay? So that, that's what's called the rebound effect. If I, when I was a coffee drinker, if I didn't drink coffee, as soon as I woke up in the morning, had a banging headache, that's addiction. So now you have to drink that coffee so your head won't hurt, so you won't be sick, so you can feel better. Cannabis is not addictive, okay? People might like to smoke weed, whatever, but it's not addictive. You're not gonna be sick and have withdrawal symptoms because of it. So I don't know Homie Kwan's story. I don't know the facts around him, but I know that a lot of these rappers are addicted to stuff, okay? They're drinking lean, they're taking pills, how they got like that, maybe it was just them trying to be recreational and experiment with drugs, or maybe they were prescribed opioids, because opioids are prescribed like crazy, okay? And whatever you're being prescribed for opioids for, you can use cannabis, okay? And this is, you know, what part of what I do. If, if you're even interested in getting off your medications and using cannabis, or you're interested in um, not being on medication and using cannabis, I can definitely help with that, okay? I'm, I'm in the process of putting that all together on my website as a service that I offer. Um, but this book right here, um, The Cannabis Prescription, okay, this book is written by a pharmacist. How to Use Medical Marijuana to Reduce or Replace Pharmaceutical Medicine, okay? It's a good book. And even in this book, she talks about how the medical industry the medical industry, um, sorry, caused this opioid epidemic. Okay, they prescribe it for something, you end up in the hospital, you get surgery, they're prescribing it, and then you get addicted. And now you're no longer needing it, but you're searching the street for pills. So if I hear somebody dies from an opioid um, addiction, I don't just jump to thinking like, oh, they're an irresponsible drug addict, which maybe I did think at one point. But when I started to understand that this is coming from the medical industry, they're getting people addicted, they know this, like, you know what, let me see if I can find something out of this, um, and CBD is very useful for helping you to get over addictions, okay, not THC, but CBD, and again, I'll do an in-depth talk about this on my page, The Body Scientist, soon, so I'll probably do it tomorrow, so definitely follow me there so you can hear more in-depth conversation. Um, hold on a second. I'm looking for something. Oh, okay. So in this, this book, this is a good book. I always recommend, there's a lot of good books. There's a, there's a couple others I'm going to show you. And if you follow me on my Instagram page, the body scientist, the underscore body underscore scientist, you can look at the books that I post. I post books all the time. But, so I'm just going to read an excerpt, right? So this is chapter eight, pain due to injury and neuropathic pain and inflammation, right? And so... Okay, hold on a minute. Okay, it says, why opioids for pain relief, okay? Opium, derived from opium poppy, has been used in medicine, like cannabis, for thousands of years. The most widely accepted pharmaceutical treatment for nociceptive pain is the use of opioids, okay? So, opioids is the most commonly prescribed um, drug for pain, which um, originated with morphine from the opium poppy. Opioids have been regarded for millennia as among the most effective drugs for the treatment of pain. Their, um, their use in, in, in the management of acute severe pain and chronic pain related to advanced medical illness is considered the standard of care in most of the world. Okay, So this is not just an American issue. It's considered the standard of care in most of the world, okay? Because a lot of times people talk about medical stuff and they always talk about the U.S. and this and that, but it's like a lot of countries. It's not just the U.S., okay? So, let me continue. It says, opioid use for chronic pain exploded in the mid-1990s with expanded prescribing for long-acting, high-dose opioids for everything from knee pain to acute post-surgery pain. The result of this massive overprescribing of opioids has spawned generations of addicted patients. Now, Rich Homie Kwan is 34, so 
Also, a lot of people, he's 34, but a lot of people like who in their 20s, maybe even their early 30s, were born to drug addicted parents too. Even fentanyl, when women get when women get an epidural in labor, that is opioid, okay? So you're literally putting opioids in your baby and in yourself in labor when you get an um, epidural, and that can sometimes affect people's propensity for addiction later in life, okay? So, and cannabis can be used in labor for those things. It has been for um, thousands of years, okay? But they want to demonize cannabis and give you these opioids is going to kill you and make you highly addicted, okay? And again, like I said, I'm going to do a more in-depth scientific talk on this tomorrow on my other page. Okay, so it says addiction is a two-pronged process. First, the substance involved must induce a significant withdrawal response once removed. Now, I just talked about that, right? Many things like caffeine and sugar, I talked about that too, can cause withdrawal, but they don't necessarily ruin lives as opioids can. This brings us to the second and most insidious aspect of addiction, extreme negative changes in behavior, intense drug craving and compulsive use. The opioid receptor system influences both areas of addiction, pain and behavior, which may explain why opioid addiction is so deeply destructive, okay? Um, so you know what? I'm not going to keep reading this to you, but basically, and I'll get more in depth into it in my science, my, my, my science talk tomorrow, but also when doses of opioids are consumed or mixed with other depressants like alcohol and benzodia benzodiazepines, patients increase their risk of decreased respiration resulting in death. Now let me say something about opioid, I mean cannabis. Okay, so we have opioid receptors and we have cannabinoid receptors, okay? And um, that, that's why cannabis works for so many health, so many problems in the body because we have these cannabinoid receptors over every organ in our body. And when cannabinoids bind to it, it helps to modulate that system. However, there are no cannabinoid receptors in the part of the brain, the brainstem that, that is uh, involved in respiration, which is why cannabis cannot kill you. You cannot OD on cannabis. You can eat all the edibles in the world and you will pass out, but you will not die, okay? Now, only time it's, it can be risky is if it's a kid. If it's a child and they've eaten a bunch of edibles, that can, like, you could almost sedate them, where there's been a few incidents, incidences where kids had to be um, put on a, that it'd be intubated, right? But as an adult, it's like, no, you go to sleep, you won't die. Now, um, opioids, there are opioid receptors in the brain stem, in the, par the part of the brain that's responsible for respiration, so it can kill you, it can make you stop breathing, okay? Um, and then when you're combining with other things like alcohol and benzodiazepines, I think that the girl enchanting Gucci's artist, I think they said that she was also taking benzodiazepines as well, okay? Um, and also this book is saying, see, I knew that there was no, I knew that, um, there were no endocannabinoid receptors in the part of the brain that has to do with respiration, but this book is also saying that there are no endocannabinoid receptors contained in the lungs either, okay? So it's not, it's not gonna stop you from breathing, but there's opioid receptors in those places. Now, cannabinoids cross talk with opioid receptors. Cannabinoids affect opioid receptors, which is another reason, another mechanism of action as to why cannabinoids can be so powerful for um, preventing pain and stopping pain and analgesic, okay? And it says that opioids have been linked to the worsening of dementia and, then, and therefore should be avoided in older patients. The exact group of people most likely to be, most likely to have increased levels of chronic pain. And I work with a lot of elderly people with cannabis medicine. The, the bulk of people that I have worked with are like 70 and up, okay? That have all kinds of different chronic pain issues or health issues and the doctors wanna put them on all these medications Cannabis is so effective. Not only that, they don't have to take it forever. They might take it a few times, the pain goes away, they're good, okay? Whereas opioids, you, you end up being addicted on some forever unless you like really are trying to break this addiction. And, and I'm gonna talk about this in my science talk tomorrow, but cannabis can help break those addictions. CBD is very effective for stuff like that, okay? So I'm not gonna, um, 
get really into this because um, I'm not gonna this this conversation wasn't meant to be super scientific. I'm gonna do that tomorrow. But opioids were never meant to be prescribed long for long term chronic issues. They were meant to be for short, acute issues. Okay, and so this is it's the medical industry that has driven this opioid epidemic. Um, and you have people dying. I think opioids is the number one cause of death for adults in this country. I think so. Hold on. And I think guns is the number one cause of death for children in this country. Isn't that terrible? Hold on a minute. Um, let me see something. Let me just look this up. Number one cause of death for adults in the U.S. I'm, I think it's going to be opioids. Let me see. Mm, no. Um, I don't know. I thought it was number one cause of death. I'm not. I'm not going to spend time looking it up because I'm talking to you guys. But what I did find is that the number of people dying from drug overdose um, in the U.S. amounted to um, seventy thousand six hundred and thirty in 2019, and approximately half of these deaths involve synthetic opioids. Okay. Oh wow, this is a really bad statistic I'm about to read. From 2013 to, to 2019, the age-adjusted synthetic opioid death rates in the United States increased by 1,040%. What has ever increased 1,000 plus percent over any time period, let alone six years, okay? That was 2019. It's 2024, almost 2025 now. So who knows what percentage that is? Like, that's crazy, okay? There's a lot of people dying from opioids of all ages. And I see a lot of older generation. When I say older generation, I mean people in their 50s, maybe their 40s, but 50s, 40s and 60s of the hip-hop generation. A lot of people will talk about the young people and be like, oh, we sold drugs. We didn't do drugs. And they try to clown them as like, oh, they're drug addicts and we sold drugs. First of all, that's not a flex, okay? Because if you were selling drugs, you are, you caused this problem, okay? Because any of us who are around doing the crack era, and I will say crack doesn't seem to kill people. Like crack has seemed to live forever. I don't know what that's about. And people think I'm joking, but I really think crack is a fertility drug. Because every crackhead, I don't care if it's a man or a woman, they have a bunch of kids. And people will say, oh, because they have sex a lot. But a lot of people have sex a lot and don't have all those kids, okay? Crackheads, I have never seen a crackhead with one kid, two kids. No, They always have like five plus, okay? Flavor, flav, like, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. I'm just saying that um, those of us who lived through the crack era, I grew up in New York City. I grew up in Harlem, New York City. They, they filmed uh, New Jack City on my block. They filmed Juice on my block, okay? Like in my building. I grew up seeing crack vials all over the ground, okay, in the 80s, and in New York, and it was like, my generation was like, we're not doing that, like, crack was whack to us, we saw crackheads walking around looking crazy, like, there was nothing cool about that, and when I was in my early 20s, it was like, it was, when I was in my 20s, it was like, a lot, it seemed like it was a southern thing, people down south were drinking lean, I remember when 3-6 Mafia came out with Sip, Zip It On Some Scissor, I was in college, my twin brother, he went to school in Virginia. He went to Norfolk State, so he's in the South. The music that people listen to in the South or the North has always been different. Even now when I hang around people, even people from Chicago, from the South, like a lot of the hip hop that they listened to was different. Like they weren't really listening to Jay-Z. I mean, some people were, but they listened to some other stuff. Now, my brother came back, like I, we heard sipping on some scissors, but we didn't know what they were talking about. And I remember when we found out they were talking about drinking lean, People in New York were like, they're drinking cough syrup? Like, that sounded crazy to us. That was not a thing. It wasn't maybe until a decade later till you start finding out people in New York are drinking lean. Like, why are you doing that? Like, we never were doing that. Like, that was this, that came, the people in the South, black people in the South were doing way more drugs. Somehow, that got up to North, up North, and these idiots started doing it too, right? But, um... If you were a drug dealer, like to me, there's nothing, if you sold weed, I'm not talking about that, but the people who were selling the crack and heroin, especially crack, because I grew up during the crack era, there's nothing about that to, that's not a flex. You destroyed communities. Every single community in every single hood in America was destroyed by crack and crack dealers. And people complain about the, um, 
what is it? The um, what is that bill? Um, that the crime bill. Okay. My dad was one person, and a lot of black people, but I remember my father being very much for the crime bill, and he wrote an article. He was a journalist in New York City at the time, an op-ed journalist, and he wrote an article saying he wanted to line up all the crack dealers in Harlem and execute them, okay? Because he came from the black power civil rights movement where, so to him and his people, these crack dealers were destroying Harlem. They were destroying what they fought for. You know, I came from the black intellectuals and freedom fighters in Harlem, not the hood rats. And not the gangsters, except the old school. I knew, I knew I, there was a man when I was a kid who, he, when I was little in the 80s, he was like my grandfather. Always had on fur coats, always fly. I didn't know he was a Harlem gangster until I grew up and he died and my dad told me he was partial owner of Harlem World. But he was from the old school gentleman gangsters, okay? Not the crack dealers, okay? Not the crack dealers who destroyed the hood with the dumb shit, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, the people who did that caused this issue. So now you have people in their early 30s or 20s who grew up drug addicted, drug parents who were doing drugs. And so what your mother did, what your father did before you were conceived has everything to do uh, with, like if, if your parents, even your father, like yeah, women grow the baby and are pregnant. But what the man was doing and the condition of his, his sperm also affects that. So if you have a man who was doing drugs and you could pass it on too. So I'm just saying there needs to be more compassion for um, the younger generation as well who are, are having these issues. And then for older people, there needs to be more compassion because if you're going with the medical model, they're prescribing opioids all the time. A lot of people trust their doctors, they trust the medical community that that's okay and they get addicted. And now you're on the street looking for pills and you end up dying because you're addicted. So I'm going to do a more in-depth talk tomorrow on my page, The Body Scientist. I'll get more into the science because People don't seem to, I don't seem to hold people's attention when I get into the science, but people who want to know more about this and the science behind using cannabis and opioids and stuff like that for pain, please join me um, on my page. And then, so I showed you this book already, okay? This book is written by a pharmacist, okay? The Cannabis Prescription, how to, how to use medical marijuana to reduce or replace pharmaceutical medicine, medication. This is an excellent book. Um, then... You have, this, this is another good book. Okay, this is written by a medical doctor. I'm gonna interview him soon. But this is called The Doctor Approved Cannabis Handbook, okay? Reverse disease, treat pain, and enhance your wellness with medical marijuana and CBD by Benjamin Kaplan, MD. Very good book, he's a medical doctor in Boston. And then here's another one that's a good one for people who are interested in using cannabis for health issues is this book. Um, your cannabis CBD THC ratio, a guide to pre uh, precision dosing for health and wellness. And this is written by a PhD. So you have PhDs, MDs, nurses, all who write books. And I want to write one that's dealing with um, nutrition and cannabis that's not being talked about. So I'll come from a nutrition standpoint. There's so much to talk about when it comes to cannabis medicine. It's something I very much believe in, of course. I did my master's degree in it. So you hear me talk about it more. May Rich Homie Kwan rest in peace. It breaks my heart because I don't know if you, there was a, a call from you know his partner who they have two kids, a three, I think a three-year-old and a 10-year-old. I mean, how terrible that is. She thought he was asleep and he's dead. And you have two kids with him and, and it's just, it's terrible. Okay, so my compassion goes out to him. He died too soon. And for those of you, if you're addicted to opioids, I really suggest you do something, you try to do something about it. Cannabis, CBD in particular, can help you wean yourself off of these addictions. And if you are going to get surgery or you have, you got into a car accident, and you have some type of chronic pain, I suggest don't take op opioids at all, okay? Cannabis oil can be very effective, super effective, okay, at all of that. Headaches, back pain, whatever pain you're going through, okay? Follow me on my other page, The Body Scientist, where I will talk about that more. Um, if you learned something from this video, please like it, please share it, please follow me on YouTube and Instagram, and have a good day, and I'll see you guys later, okay? <laughs> Bye.